behalf of the Board of Directors of City Trust that we congratulate the 2023 John Scott Award winners. We honor them for their remarkable achievements and for their lifetime of activism in the fight to preserve our planet. I do believe in another part of the world as we speak, there are 80,000 people who have joined in the fight to protect our planet. They both honor the legacy of Dr. Franklin, and we're all the better for it. And now it's my pleasure to present to you, and for someone that you may or may not know, in his previous job, uh, he served as, uh, I think, the mayor of the city. <laughs> my friend, Michael Nutt.
Philadelphia's Dock Creek, and even studied weather patterns. I think we all know Ben Franklin is a pretty busy guy. Dr. Franklin would be honored to have Dr. Sokolow and Dan join the ranks of John Scott Award winners. And tonight, we are honored to oblige him on behalf of a grateful nation for their lifetime of outstanding achievement. And now it's my good fortune to introduce Dr. Marcia Lester. She's the chair of the John Scott Awards Committee. And I want to ask that we give recognition to all of the members of the John Scott Awards Committee. Please thank them for their service. Now, Dr. Lester is the Edmund J. Kahn Distinguished Professor of Chemistry at the University of Pennsylvania. She's also the first woman to lead Penn's Department of Chemistry, and she is a world-renowned expert in her own right on the physical chemistry of volatile organic compounds present in the Earth's atmosphere. As you can see from the awardees we honor this evening, the committee, of course, has done a great job in presenting truly outstanding candidates for the Scott Award, and we congratulate them and thank them again for their terrific selections this year. And so with that, uh, Dr. Lester, would you please come to the lecture? Okay, so um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2023 John Scott Award Ceremony. Um, I have a little further story to tell about John Scott. <clears throat> Um, as you heard, his endowment, or his bequest, um, to the city of Philadelphia started out with just $4,000 and uh, with 3% uh, interest stock in the United States, and this money was given to the city of Philadelphia. His will stipulated that the interest and dividends of this stock would be distributed to these amazing men and women who, um, for their ingenious inventions. John Scott chose Philadelphia for this bequest, but it was not known why. He had a long-standing interest in America and an appreciation for the achievements of Benjamin Franklin. But an amazing aspect of Scott's legacy is that initial investment of $4,000 in 1816 is now worth close to $1 million. That's an initial investment um, is still funding this award some 200 years later is, is, is through the power of compounding. And Einstein is supposed to have referred to compound interest as the eighth wonder of the world. And that must be true, or we wouldn't be here tonight. Throughout the years, awards have been made for inventions in industry, agriculture, manufacturing, science, and medicine. And since 1920, most of those have been in science and medicine. They, awards have recognized significant contributions in prevention of yellow fever and malaria, in the development of penicillin, streptomycin, and most recently the development of effective MNRA vaccines against COVID-19. As you heard, there are many just incredibly impressive recipients of, uh, of this award. I'll just name a couple more. Um, particularly to get some gender um, uh, <laughs> diversity in. Uh, Marie Curie um, and uh, uh, Buckminster Fuller, Edwin Land, Irving Langmuir, uh, my former colleague Alan McDermott, Jonas Salk, Len Seaborg, the Wright brothers, and as you heard, the most recent Nobel laureates in medicine, Catalin Carrico and Drew Weissman. So before I go on, um, uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge um, that we, these awards, um, uh, we have some of the past winners of these awards here, and um, I'd like to um, honor my colleague um, Emily Carter, the 2019 awardee, Regina Bychek, um, uh from 2017, and I, I don't know if Virginia Lee has made it, but she is also on the award committee from 2012. And if I could ask those, uh, my colleagues to stand for a moment. Please. So this committee meets about monthly. We now do it by Zoom. Um, and uh, we meet regularly and discuss these great scientists that we are selecting among. And we, this year, we've, we began selecting themes for these awards. 
And um, in addition to myself, um, who I'm new to this uh, role as secretary or in charge of this advisory committee, I want to acknowledge my colleague, um, Hailong Dai, who served in this capacity for several years, um, and also uh, Maggie Abu Garbia, Clyde Barker, Emily Carter, Eduardo Glantz, Virginia Lee, George Pappas, and Amos Smith. And for those of you that are here, would you please rise so that we can please thank you for your service. that we all hear about a lot today, thus emerged. 
where carbon dioxide, which otherwise would have been released to the atmosphere when a fuel, a hydrocarbon fuel, is burned, instead is redirected and stored underground. In 1997, Rob led the first major workshop on CCS for the U.S. Department of Energy, which catalyzed the expansion of the U.S. effort, and then on to become a major global option for greenhouse gas management, which we are now seeing uh, the fruits of today. Rob thus could be considered as one of the fathers of CCS as a strategy for carbon mitigation. Rob's credibility with industry, government, and NGOs enabled him to launch in 2000 Princeton's Carbon Mitigation Initiative, a campus-wide science and engineering research effort co-led by Rob until 2019 and, and, and also with ecologist Steve Pakala, who, who co-leads it today. That, that initiative in, integrates climate science with engineering solutions. In fact, I should mention that I got my start in much of the work that I've done over the last 15 plus years in the area of sustainable energy and carbon mitigation through an initial, an initial seed grant that came out of um, that related group of, of um, to that community on, on the Princeton campus. Emblematic of the Carbon Mitigation Initiative's approach is Rob's 2004 Wedges papers, and it, uh, it's quite famous now, co-authored with Steve Pakala, that offered practical, implementable, implementable solutions to reducing CO2 emissions to net zero. The impact of this hopeful, practical paper has been profound. Since Direct Air Capture Technologies, also, he, he was on the, com the two committees that were extremely important from the National Academy studies on America's climate options and America's energy choices. And very recently, just this fall, a timely analysis that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academies of Sciences of the impact of an ammonia economy on the nitrogen cycle and climate. Ammonia is being considered as an alternative fuel and it's very important to understand what it may do to the climate. And even just a couple of weeks ago, it, it never ends, Rob. <laughs> Rob co-authored with Chris Gregg of the Anlinger Center a compelling op-ed in the Washington Post, arguing ahead of COP28 that started today in the United Arab Emirates, that there is a viable middle ground strategy between the never fossilers and the fossil fuel crowds that could get us to net zero much more quickly. Rob, your visionary, rigorous leadership in this space for more than five decades is why we honor you here tonight. We are so glad you continue your work. The earth thanks you, as do we. Please join me in welcoming to the stage the one and only Robert Sokolow. of the City Trust of Philadelphia, members of the John Scott Award Advisory Committee, friends and extended family, and thank you, Emily, for such a warm and generous and over-the-top introduction. <laughs> I didn't write over-the-top here. <laughs> it is a special pleasure to follow in your footsteps as a John Scott awardee. You did understand that. She was the 2019 winner. You must get the same kick that I do out of being in the company of Marie Curie, who received this award in 1921 for the discovery of radium, and Thomas Edison, who just won it in 1929. When you look it up, it says, everybody else has a specific invention. His says, numerous inventions. <laughs> Even if it feels a bit ridiculous, which it does. This year's John Scott Award recognizes a new kind of science, it hasn't had a name, and this evening I'm giving it one, Anthropos Anthropocene Science. As many of you know, but maybe not all, 
The Anthropocene is the very recent geological period when human activity is dominating the Earth. It just feels different enough to the people who work with the Earth than all of the fossil records leading to different epochs and, and eras and so on, that they've given it a new name. We humans used to be puny, but now doing ordinary things, we can modify our planet substantially to our detriment. Anthropocene science, accordingly, is global, and it includes both people and the planet. <clears throat> Anthropocene science has a mission. To, it seeks to anticipate future environmental change and to slow down that change. Michael Mann and I, Michael being the person you'll hear from in a moment, work on two different but closely related aspects of Anthropocene science. Michael has been a leader in understanding the problem of climate change, how the Earth responds to human activity. I have been scoping what are called optimistically solutions to climate change, ways of slowing climate change down. In working on solutions, I'm a representative of a cohort of physical scientists who changed fields to work on the environment around 1970, which is around when I did. In my case, after a decade of working in theoretical physics on quarks. Why then? Why 1970-ish? Some of you will remember a bumper sticker from the 1960s, some of you. Science for the people it was on backs of, on cars, it was on lapel of buttons and so on. My cohort connected with that bumper sticker. In that same period, we were jolted by pictures of Earth from space that carry the message that humans are alone in the universe and have a planet to take care of. I love that this message was based in science, that it was global, and that it was moral. After the summer of 1969, for me, quarks were out and the Earth was in. I like to say that working on climate change creates a... Oh, thank you. Perfect. I'd like to say that working on climate change creates a planetary identity. It doesn't matter from what country any carbon dioxide is emitted because it gets well stirred within months in the atmosphere. So thinking about solutions requires thinking like an earthling. Permit me please to describe briefly two subfields of Anthropocene science that I have helped to develop and Emily did mention them both already briefly. The first is energy conservation. We humans were wasting energy big time in the 1970s. Some of you will remember that. There were the tail fins on the cars and no one cared about drag, for example. When I said I was interested in that, I was told to back off by colleagues, by well-wishers. You're a scientist. Find us new energy sources and let people use energy however they wish. Instead, with colleagues, I launched a multi-year field study of the heating and cooling of already built residences. At our, recite, at our research site, Twin Rivers, New Jersey, which is exit 8A on the 295, uh, our, at our research, at our research, sorry, on the Jersey Turnpike, at our research site, Twin Rivers, Architects, engineers, psychologists, and statisticians investigated building design and construction, as well as homeowner behavior. Before long, energy efficient buildings became a subfield of its own with major programs at our national laboratories, as Emily mentioned, including especially Lawrence Berkeley Lab with Art Rosenfeld. Refrigerators and windows became more efficient. The double pane window was not common, the, the, the uh, film on the double pane window, even less common. Now they're more routine. And entirely new lighting technologies ended the domination of Mr. Edison's tungsten filament light bulb, honored here and then surpassed. In the late 1980s, another subfield of Anthropocene science emerged called industrial ecology. It investigates the reuse and recycling of materials. I began looking into the industrial ecology of carbon this time I would follow carbon flows. 
Soon after, with my ecologist colleague, Steve Pacala, as Emily mentioned, I introduced stabilization wedges, each wedge being a quantified 50-year deployment from here future to the future of a low carbon strategy already widely known, a wedge of automobile efficiency, a wedge of wind substituting for coal, a wedge where carbon dioxide emissions are prevented from reaching the atmosphere and sent instead deep underground. Ours was the already paper. It brought a message of hope and it buttressed ambition. One might well guess that a physicist co-invented the wedges model. Physis physics promotes a search for minimalist, idealized frameworks that capture the key features of a, of a problem using so-called back-of-the-envelope reasoning. The wedges model does that. Looking ahead, here are two urgent tasks for Anthropocene science. The first is to help the world reconcile the claim of urgency and the claim of what I call conditionality. On the one hand, the threat of severe climate change is credible and calls for decisive action. On the other hand, everyone wants to place conditions on that action, and these, action, these conditions have much merit. Don't expand nuclear power until the world has moved away from nuclear weapons. Close down the fossil fuel industries because they have such a powerful vested interest in the status quo. Preserve beloved landscapes and seascapes from invasions of wind turbines and solar panels. Avoid geoengineering because it is ungovernable. Especially for young people, the conditions that must be met are about justice. It cannot be acceptable to slow down climate change, they say, unless at the same time the world becomes less unequal. A paramount question for the next decade is whether human beings can tackle climate change effect effectively with so much conditionality. It's the horns of a dilemma, one could say. A second assignment for the next decade is to improve the communications of Anthropocene science so that it becomes more widely trusted by the political middle. I'm so glad we have real politicians who know about this and can help me understand it. A broader consensus in favor of vigorous action than exists today could emerge, I think, if more people feel that they are hearing a full story. A place to start would be to convey that climate scientists do not know how fast bad outcomes will arrive because the Earth so far has revealed so little about its tipping points. The current uncertainty properly conveyed would build support for climate-driven investments, I think, because human beings are risk-averse and routinely invest in protection against bad outcomes. From the uncertainty comes motivation to action, not motivation to withdraw. I have had so much help getting here. I think of my parents thriving in liberal New York and prioritizing progressive education. The schools they chose for me encouraged social service and global citizenship. I think of my many mentors in science who urged me to, who urged me to hear the distant drummer of choosing a career in choosing a career, something off the beaten track. Among them, Ed Purcell, Harvey Brooks, Murray Gelman, Mark Ross, Murph Goldberger, George Reynolds, and Irv Glassman. We, we, we really had people paving the way. I think of my closest collaborators, especially John Hart, Bob Williams, and Steve Bacala, and how fortunate they and I have been to work at institutions whose cardinal virtues are excellence and boldness, and which ensure that we can work on the world's most vexing problems, unfettered by the agendas of others. Lightning has struck two buildings on the same Philadelphia street at nearly the same time. Receiving this award in this building is the first lightning strike. The second occurred last spring, one block away at Chestnut and Third, when the Science History Institute acquired my papers and began archiving them. Patrick Shea, Olivia Hosey, and Grace Cook are here, all from the Science History Institute, cementing the connection. They had no, there's two developments in my life, that neither one foreseen a year ago, one block apart. I am nearly certain that there will be future John Scott Awards in Anthropocene Science. Why? Because the broader community of scientists, gradually but steadily, is increasingly prioritizing research in climate science and climate solutions. 
This in turn will steadily increase the number of talented junior and senior scientists who commit, these, who commit to these problems and bring to bear currently unforeseen research strategies out of such ferment new awardees. Thank you very much. Speaking of announcements, I would like to advise everyone here that we've now been joined by four budding scientists from Girard College, uh, along with the president of Girard College, David Hardy. They've just joined us. And let's see what happens in the ensuing decades as to whether or not one or all of them might be awarding Sir John Scott going forward.